Hi, I'm Gary Katz. I want to thank all the folks who bought copies of my DVD programs over the last 20 years. If it wasn't for their support and the support of companies like Windsor One and Stabila, I never would have been able to produce what turned out to be a 10 program series on mastering finished carpentry. Those 12 to 20 year old videos look pretty terrible compared to streaming video today. And that's why I'm no longer selling the DVDs, but the carpentry techniques haven't aged much at all. And that's why I'm making them available here for free. Enjoy. All right, now let's look at pre-hungs. I've got the other jam in the door we just hung out of here now, and the opening's wide open. It's uh, a rough opening, measures about 34 inches wide and measures about 81 inches tall. We're gonna have a little bit of a problem getting a pre-hung in here in height, but these are the kinds of things that you have to look for when you order pre-hung doors. And that's the thing I wanna talk about first, ordering pre-hungs. There's two methods used to hand doors, and you really need to know this. Some companies use hand their doors with the butt and the butt methods. Remember, we had the last jam hinged on this side, and if you put your butt in the butts, and you swung the door this way, it was a right-hand door. But some companies use a different system. Sometimes they look at a door and they look at the hinge side. They call this the hinge side method. Like this door right here. If you were to look at this door, they'd look at these hinges and they'd say, oh, the hinges are on the left. You stand where the door is, you stand in front of the door, you swing it toward you, and then the hand that the hinges are on is the is the uh, swing of the door, is the hand of the door. So that door we just hung here, using the button to butt methods would be a right hand door, but using the hinge side method, this would be a left hand door because those hinges were on the left side of the door when I stood facing the door and swung it toward me. So there's two different methods and they come up with exactly the opposite results. So you gotta be really careful when you order your doors. So be certain you're using the method your door supplier uses when you hand your doors. A drawing is usually the best way to be certain you're going to get the correct door. This can be particularly important when you're ordering metal jams and prefit doors. Sometimes on custom jobs, the jams come from one company and the doors come from another. Trust me, I know from experience, it's a bummer when your delivery shows up and you've got 100 left-hand doors and 100 right-hand jams. If you get into commercial doors and hardware, it's even more critical that you understand these definitions, including one more right-hand reverse and left-hand reverse locks. With mortise locks, operating functions change depending upon whether the door swings out from a locked room or into a locked room. In other words, whether it's a classroom or an office door. To hand doors correctly, remember a left-hand door that swings out is a right-hand reverse and a right-hand door that swings out is a left-hand reverse. A lot of us learn carpentry on our own and we tend to make up our own language along the way. Some of you may refer to it as wall thickness or jam condition or wall condition, but the point is always measure the thickness of the wall and order appropriate jams. Unfortunately, jam manufacturing seems to be done by folks without much field experience. For instance, a standard jam for half inch drywall measures four and nine sixteenths. That's only a sixteenth of an inch wider than the sum of the exact parts three and a half inches for the stud and one inch for the two sheets of drywall. But I've never seen a three and a half inch stud and besides they're never straight and the drywall is never tight to the jam. Let's just look at this opening. The drywall isn't fastened to the jam tight to the studs. The metal track, which is right up in here, is pushing the drywall apart, wider than the two by four. I mean, this is a finished carpenter's daily nightmare. It should be a four and a half inch jam. I mean, that's what it measures right down here. But up at the top, that's not gonna work. That's where that top track is. You can see the gap right here, it's pushing the drywall away from the wall. You can order three and five eighths inch jams for a half inch drywall and three and seven eighths inch jams for five eighths drywall. That makes it a little easier to get the casing on. And if the wall has sheer paneling or sheathing, add for that too. With this door, I'll have to make jam extensions, which always go on the stop side of the door, which will be on this side of the wall. For interior pre-hungs, be sure to order the doors cut for carpet so you don't have to cut them on the job. 
or whatever kind of floor covering is going down. If the door swings over a vinyl floor, you may want to use the same undercut measurements so the door will clear a throw rug. And in some parts of the country, the doors have to clear the carpet by at least a half an inch or more to allow for proper ventilation. For exterior prefit door units, know what kind of lock sets you're going to be using and what kind of deadbolt so the manufacturer prepares the doors properly. You can also specify the threshold, the door shoe or sweep, and the weather stripping too. These are all critical components, so take care when ordering doors. If you want to learn more about these features, pick up a copy of Installing and Hanging Doors. That's a retitled paperback version of my first book, The Door Hanger's Handbook, which is now out of print. All right. When it's time to install doors, before we spread out our tools, we always walk the job and mark the swing on the openings, either on the trimmer or the jack stead, whatever you want to call this stud. And after the swings are marked, we scatter the jams in the doors. Then we take out our tools. Speaking of which, what comes to your mind when you see a finished carpenter with a sawzall in his hands? Right, someone made a mistake. Some door or cabinet has to be cut out and installed again. Scattering the doors and making sure the swings and jams are correct is the best way to avoid having to take out a sawzall. Another technique you can use that avoids a sawzall is finding the high point of the floor before installing any doors or jams, or windows for that matter. Yeah, this is a technique that's best used during framing before the windows and exterior doors are set, and it's called shooting a control line. You know, you got to invest in high-end tools if you want to succeed at high-end work. Most carpenters will tell you that measuring and layout tools are the most important investments they make. These tools must be precise and they must be dependable so you can get the job done right from the very first day. These days, I use a line laser to shoot a control line. I prefer these lasers for two reasons. First, because they have a pendulum lock, so when I'm not using the laser and it's in my toolbox, the pendulum isn't banging around beating itself up. When you turn a laser like this on, you release the pendulum lock. So I'll switch this on, and now you can hear the pendulum. When I shut it off, the pendulum's locked down. The other reason I like this tool is because it's a pulsing laser. You can't see it, but the laser light right here is actually pulsing very quickly, so it can be picked up with a detector. With a detector, I can use this tool inside huge rooms where you can't see the laser line, and I can use it outside too, so I don't need an expensive rotary laser for most carpentry applications. Let me show you what I mean. I can take the laser and set it on my ladder, and I can take the detector and turn it on. You can hear the beeping tone as I come down, and the line comes up against the center of the detector. It'll go to a constant tone. When if I go too far below it, it starts beeping slowly. So when you're low, it beeps slow. And if you're high, it beeps fast. It's a real simple tool to use, and it really helps you take one tool, one laser, and use it in a host of different applications. Now, shooting a control line is one of those techniques that helps you see the whole picture and control chaos. It's a layout and measuring technique that's critical if you want to get the job done right the first time, the easy way. And trust me, this is the easy way to do it. It's a two-step technique. First, place the laser on a ladder or use a tripod or any kind of laser mount. Shoot a line across all the openings within sight, a whole room or a whole house. Then make a mark on both sides of every single opening. And I'm just going to mark right where the laser line is on both sides of this opening. You'd want to mark every opening that you can see. You'll probably have to pick up the ladder and the laser and move it to some other spot in the house if you want to get the whole house. Just set up the ladder in another room or another location where you can see the previous marks and adjust the laser line to the exact same height. You can use small shims of plywood or whatever you need to just to reference off those other lines. Then continue marking both sides of every opening. When you finish and you have the control line around the whole job, in other words, you made these pencil marks on each side of every opening around the whole job, put away the laser and pull out a tape measure. What you want to do is you want to find the high point of the floor on the whole job. Now that's going to be the door or the window with the least distance between the floor and the control line. That's where you have to be for the second step.
For the second step, you have to know the distance from the bottom of your pre-hung jams all the way to the top of the inside of the jam. You know, I like to start a job by measuring the pre-fit exterior jams. They're the ones that count from the bottom of the threshold down here all the way to the top of the inside of the jam. That's because you want the inside of the jams to create a level line around a room or an entire home. So the casing will be level around every door and window throughout the whole house, from this door to this window to the interior pre-hung doors and everywhere else around the house. Measure to the top of the inside of your jam, and let's say it's 80 and a half. We'll put our mark right there to the top of the inside of the jam at 80 and a half. And then measure to your control line. This measurement up here would be the bottom of the head jam, the inside. So we're going to measure from that mark down to the control line, and that's 44 inches. Just happens to come out even at right at 44. That's the magic number. In fact, you can cut a piece of doorstop, something like this. You could even take this piece of doorstop, set it up against that mark, make a mark on it down here, right at your control line, and then cut this thing off and you'd have a little story pole that you could walk around the whole job and place that story pole right on your control line. If this were the cut you made, you could put the bottom of the piece right on your control line and just score a line across the top and you'd be right on level line across every single head jam in the whole house. Do that on the sides of every single door and window and it'll be a lot easier to set your jams. Those lines will save you tons of time They'll protect you from having to pull out a sawzall. If you're installing only one or two doors, you don't need a control line, but you can still avoid holding a level over your head. I mean, that's a slow and frustrating technique. You still need a really accurate level, but you don't have to hold it over your head, especially when you're installing a pair of doors. Instead, start by putting your level on the floor. It's best if the level fits the opening, you know, the rough opening, pretty close from trimmer to trimmer. That's another good reason it helps to have levels in multiple sizes. For wide openings, use a long level. And for really wide openings, use an extension level. You can level the heads with a long level, and for a single door, you can use a short level or a long level on a wide opening. Shim the level until the bubbles are centered. So I'm just going to put a shim in here until I get the bubble on this vial dead center between the lines. And we already know from shooting that control line that shim is going to be about a quarter of an inch. On most jobs, we install the doors before the finished flooring goes in. But if the finished floors are installed first, like hardwood or tile or stone or something like that, you can't shim up one leg of the jam. Instead, you have to cut the opposite leg. And that's another reason to always start by leveling the floor so you can know exactly how much to cut off. If the level is off by a quarter of an inch like this one, you know you have to cut a quarter of an inch off the jam on the high side of the floor. That means I've got to cut a quarter of an inch off this side of the jam. You can mark and measure the thickness of the shim to check how much you have to cut off the jam leg on the high side of the floor. Or, you know, you could use a tape measure if you wanted to and just measure down from the level to the floor and figure out how much you have to cut off. I'll demonstrate how to cut that jam off in just a minute. But right now, let's finish prepping this opening. If the finished flooring isn't installed yet, on a concrete slab, you could take this shim, since this shim is what's going to level this opening right now, put a little adhesive underneath it, and just stick it down on the floor, right there, right where it was. And it'll stay there. Then when you set the door, you can put the door jam right on top of the shim. On a wood subfloor, like this one, you could take a nail gun and just fire a brad right through that shim, just so it'll stay still. Once the floor is level, and this is really critical for sliding doors like patio units where the sills have to be set absolutely level and perfectly straight, then you can move on to plumbing up the trimmers of the jack studs. Rough openings are generally framed two inches wider than the door itself, which allows about a half inch for adjusting the door plumb. That's because the doors come out about an inch and a half over the nominal size. And that's a good thing, because the rough openings are rarely plumb. Always measure the rough openings before installing any shims, though, just to be sure there's enough room for the shims. I've worked on a lot of rough openings that were so far out of plumb, there wasn't room to plumb the door, and the whole opening had to be reframed. 
That's why a little earlier, one of the first things you saw me do was check the width of this opening and I checked the height too. Whether you're installing a pre-fit door or just a jam, use a full length level to check the trimmers or jack studs. A short level doesn't work. Here's why. Now this is a really cool Festool level. It has a little switch right here. You can turn the lights on on the vial. And you can see these vials in the dark, which is really nice. And when you hold this level up to this terminal right here, and let's see what this looks like. Yeah, look at that. It reads perfectly plumb. But a short level probably will read plumb even if that trimmer isn't plumb, especially if it's sitting in a bow or a belly in a stud. Let me show you that. If we take this 6.6 six, six level here and we hold it against this stud, you can see that there's an eighth inch bow in this stud. And that's why that little level, the shorter level, was reading plumb. This one's not reading plumb. It's reading a true line from the bottom of the wall to the top of the opening here. And to plumb this up, I'm going to have to move that level almost a quarter of an inch away from the trimmer at the bottom of the opening. That's a good example of why you don't want to use a four foot level when you're working on doors, especially like if you're doing eight o doors, you're going to want an eight foot level. So before I install any shims, I always look at the whole picture. If the doors at the end of a hallway are flanked by two other doors or windows, always center the door between the walls or other openings so the distance between the walls or flanking casing is equal. I always start plumbing an opening on the hinge side and I keep the shims above the hinges. That's one of the reasons that my levels are marked with blue tape at all the hinge locations. So if I were to shim this one, if I had to shim it at the top, I'd shim it up here near the top of the jam and it'd be out of the way of the hinge. Years ago, I stopped installing shims right behind the hinges. Anytime the shims are right behind the top hinge, you can't adjust the jam for hinge sag, which makes it real tough to adjust the hinge gap at the top of the door. And if the floor ever settles or the walls shift a little, if you shim right behind the hinges, you aren't able to make minor adjustments in a jam, which can be a real easy way to fix a door that's rubbing on a jam. But I'll show you all that once I have this door swinging. You probably noticed that I'm using a pin nailer here to install these shims. I'm just tacking them. I never nail the heck out of the shims. That's a lesson most carpenters learn fairly fast. It's always a mistake to put too many shims, in, or too, sorry, too many fasteners into anything until you know for sure that everything's all good. Whenever you use a lot of fasteners, you always end up having to remove something, and that means a finished guy with a sawzall in his hands. Just put one or two tacks into the shims, and that way you can, it's really easy to move them later. And with these little pins, you can even drive the shim in further or pull it out real easy because they're gonna, they could twist them off real quick. Once the shims are installed, check the width of the rough opening. Definitely, if the trimmers are so far out of plumb that you have to install 3 8 inch thick shims, check the width of the opening frequently just to be sure you can still get the door in there. I can't count how many times I've had this happen to me. Personally, I like to have the opening end up about an eighth inch wider than the outside dimension of the jam. This one here right now measures 33 and 5 eighths. Oh, what a fluke. The door we're going to put in here is a 2 8 door. That's 32 inches plus a 3 quarter and 3 quarter inch jam. So you're going to want to have at least 33 and a half for the OD of the jam. And since I'm at 33 and 5 eighths, I'm exactly an eighth of an inch over the OD of the jam, which is exactly where I want to be. If the trimmer on the strike side is close to plumb, sometimes I don't bother shimming it at all until after the jam's in the opening, but it's still a lot easier to get the opening to about an eighth of an inch bigger than the OD of the jam, so when you set the jam in there, it kind of stays in there. It's not flopping around too much. All right, now we're ready for the next step, and that's cross-siding the opening. Like I said earlier, Seeing the whole picture and controlling chaos can make carpentry a lot easier and a lot more fun. That's why I cross sight every opening before I put the jammer or door in place. It's good to know what's coming around the next corner. Sometimes you can plan for the impact. 
All this is especially true for pre-hung pairs, where even little small mistakes can become huge problems instantly, like a head jam that's just a tiny bit out of level, or walls that are a little bit cross-legged. To cross-side a jam, stand a few feet away, just a little bit to the side of the opening here, and get yourself up real close to the wall. Close one eye and position yourself so that you can see the very edge of this wall, the near wall, and so then you can sight from that edge to the far wall, on, to this edge, the far wall, on the opposite side of the far wall. So what I'm saying is, I'm gonna stand right here, I'm gonna move myself so I'm looking right down that wall, and I'm gonna look down this edge right here, and I'm gonna align this edge with that far wall by moving my head back and forth. Once I get my head to the point where this point here is totally flush with the far wall there, I'm just gonna move my eyes. I'm just gonna rotate my head up and down and move my eyes up and down to see if this wall stays in plane with this wall. That's called cross-siding a jam or cross-siding an opening. It's a really good technique. It works almost 100% of the time. The only time it doesn't is if you're working on a pair of doors that's inset. You know what I mean? If, if you've got a narrower wall inside of a wider wall, and then you can't get in there to cross side it, then you've got to use cross strings. And I'm going to talk about that later. Door openings are frequently cross-legged because the bottom plates are cut out. And if the walls aren't fastened really well, they can move, either because the drywallers bang them around or because the plumber ran into the trimmer moving a cast iron tub into the bathroom. You know, sometimes you can fix a cross-legged opening easily. All you have to do, take a block of wood and a single jack, put the wood at the bottom of the wall, smack that wall over and get those things in plane before you hang the door. And that's what I mean by seeing the whole picture and controlling chaos before you start installing finish work. But sometimes you can't move a wall. If there's an outlet, like right here, be really careful. Just don't pick up a sledgehammer and start banging on the wall. The conduit feeding this outlet might be going right through the floor. And sometimes, if the walls are bolted down and there's tile on the backside or who knows what, well, I think you're getting a picture here. If that's the case, plan on moving the jam just a little at the floor. This wall is still a cross-legged a little, so I know I'm going to have to move the jam a little bit once the door is installed, but I'll get to that later. And when I do, I'll move one leg in a little, and I'll move one leg out a little, and I'll split the difference. On some jams, especially pairs of doors, and particularly pairs of pocket doors and recess doors, cross-siding isn't good enough. Instead, I cross-string the whole opening, which is the only way to check that the walls are in the same plane, from the header to the bottom plate. I've driven some small nails in here, and I kind of pound them over a little bit, just so that they're angled back against the wall. And I carry a roll of string with me so I can string an opening. It's like a fly line backing. It's real fine string. I can stretch it pretty tight here. And I'll loop it around this one. And I'll pull the string down to this one here. And then I'll go up to this one. And then back down to here. And now if I tighten this up, each one of these is tight against the wall. We want to make sure that the string's tight against the wall all the way around. And it is. And the whole test here is whether or not the string is just touching itself as it crosses itself. Now, we don't want this string to push on the first string much. We just want it to touch it. And I can see it's just starting to push on it a hair. And that's exactly the kind of situation we want. I could take this wall and move it out this way just a little bit more, or move that wall in just a little bit, and then these strings would be just perfect. But in this case, it's a pre-hung door. I don't have to worry about being perfect. I can adjust the bottoms of the legs just a little bit too. So now what I'm going to want to do, and I'll just roll this up. Now I just want to check the height of the opening one more time to see how much I have to cut off the door if I do have to. And what we'll do is 
I've measured the width already, and we know when we set the shims that the width of the opening was right. So now I'm gonna measure the height of the opening. And on this side, it's 81. The OD of that door is 80 and three quarters, so it's just barely gonna fit in here. It'd be pretty tight. And on this side, it's 81 and a half, so I'm not gonna have any problem getting it in over here at all. Remember, this header's out of level and the floor's out too. So what I need to do is cut this side. I need to cut this side anyway. Remember, we had that level on the floor, and in order to shim that level perfectly level, I had to put a quarter inch shim on this side. So I need to cut about a quarter inch off this leg anyhow. So let's do that now, and then I'll be able to set this door into the opening. I'm not cutting much off the bottom of this jam, so I can leave the door in place right inside the jam. If I were cutting a lot off, I'd probably have to pop the door out of the jam, pull it off the pins, and lay it down flat. And then I'd cut the door itself, just like I did in the last program with the saw and the guide rail. But in this case, I can use a jigsaw just to cut the bottom of the jam with the door right in the opening. And it's easy to control a jigsaw. All I have to do is measure up from the bottom of the jam here, that quarter of an inch, right there. And now, before I go too much further, let's make sure I'm on the right side of the door. I don't want to cut the wrong jam leg off. This is the hinge jam. This is a right-hand jam. This is a hinge jam. Here's the strike jam, and that's the one we want to cut, the strike jam. So I've measured the quarter inch. All I need to do is continue that line across the rest of this leg here, just like so. And now, I'll take my jigsaw, and I'll cut this. Once all the prep work is done properly, installing the door is easy. If I'm hanging a heavy solid core door or an exterior unit, I'll remove the door from the jam. It's a lot easier to fasten the jam in the opening, at least to get it secure without the weight of a big heavy door on a jam. Another alternative is to use pre-hung clips, which I'll talk about in a little bit. For this lightweight interior door, I've removed the tape too that secured the door in the jam, and I pulled the staples out of this little latch down here, this little temporary latch. It's still in the strike hole here, but if you leave that in there, it makes it easier to move the door around. Because I shim the opening first, and this is the important part, the door just fits in. This is a second shim I've installed. Here's the one I put in previously using my level. And on this side, I didn't need any shims on this side. Remember, we used that long level and the only shim we put in on this side was down at the bottom. But if you shim the opening properly so there's just enough wiggle room to get the jam in there, it makes it much easier. By driving this shim in, once I get the jam in, it locks the head jam into the opening so you can open and close the door now without the thing moving around. Now I can swing the door open. You know, I don't want to swing it too far or the thing could, could just kind of tip out of the opening. But if I swing it open just far enough, I'm going to reach behind here and make sure that this jam's flush and just throw a tack up there. And I'll do the same thing down here. Now this thing's not going to move. Now I'm going to take this jam, just make sure it's flush, and throw a tack through it. And I can do the same over here. Make sure it's flush. This can come in just a little bit. Throw a tack through it. And down here, too, I'm just going to put one nail right through here. And now I know I've got to move this jam away from the wall. So I'm going to hold it away from the trimmer a little bit and just put a nail in it to hold it still. And you'll see how that helps in just a few minutes. And actually, while I'm at it, I could put another nail in right here. And these nails that I put in are actually just going to help me when I shim because when I put my pry bar back in here to adjust this jam leg and put a shim in there, the shim won't fall down when I pry it out a little bit further. The nail will help hold it still. So, and I'll show you all of that in just a second. Right now, the important thing is to get this door in here, close it against the stop, and make sure that you corrected for the cross leg. If you weren't able to cross sight the wall and you couldn't correct all the cross leg, remember to adjust the bottoms of the legs on the jam a little just to straighten out the plane of the jam. And we can do that right now. I'm just going to close the door and see if it's touching the jam everywhere. Now, it's touching at the top, but it's not quite touching at the bottom. Remember when we had that string up there? And I said, hey, this wall probably has to move an eighth of an inch because the string was touching. That's exactly what it shows. This door isn't 
quite touching at the bottom when it's touching at the top. So all I need to do is take this jam and kick it this way about an eighth of an inch. That's it. And tack this off. And now, perfect. That thing sits nice and flat. The gaps are terrible, but that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to check all the gaps. First the cross leg, then the gaps. And we're going to start with the head gap right up here. Just like we did when we installed that new door in the old jam in the previous program. Once the jam was swinging, we checked the head gap first, then we checked the strike gap a little bit up in here. The strike gap down here doesn't matter. We can catch that later. And we want to check this hinge gap over here. Now, this hinge gap here is really critical to look at. This is where a really serious problem can manifest itself when you're hanging pre-hung doors and, and when you're hanging hinge doors, too. If you shim the door properly, I mean, if you shim the floor and you shim the jam correctly, the head gap should be pretty close. I mean, darn close when you put the door in the opening. It could be off, though, anywhere from a sixteenth to a quarter of an inch, and it's perfectly OK. Most of the time, you're going to find out, as you go through the rest of the story on this door here, you're going to find out that the reason it's off is because this gap over here is a little too big. And this happens all the time, and here's why. A heavy door like this, it'll pull down on this top hinge. Uh, like This door is real light, but I mean, if you're hanging a solid core door, a lot of times it'll pull down real hard on this hinge right here. And it'll even put a little bow, look at this, it'll put a little bow in this hinge jam right here. And look at how I can change the gap right above this door just by pulling on that hinge just a little bit. Now, I'm not moving a hinge. I'm moving this whole jam right here. It's because I've nailed it here, and I've nailed it at the bottom. So I have all of this adjustment right here. What you need to remember is, before you go too far with a pre-hung or any other door, just make sure that you push this jam leg back against the trimmer and secure it real good. Now, watch what happens when I push it back. That gap closes up right above the top hinge. Watch again. I'm going to push that hinge. The gap above the top hinge is going to close up. When that gap closes up, watch what else happens. Simultaneously, the strike gap right here is going to get bigger. There it is. See how it gets bigger? And look at the gap above the top of the door. Remember, it was too big. Now watch what happens. I'm going to push on this hinge. The strike gap will get a little bit bigger, and the head gap will get smaller. So what I'm doing is I'm correcting three things at one point, at one spot, by moving this hinge back toward the trimmer. I'm correcting this big hinge gap. I'm decreasing the big head gap here. And I'm increasing the strike gap, which often is a little too tight on pre-fit doors. This is a step that a lot of carpenters aren't aware of, and it spells the difference between success and failure. If the hinge gap above the top hinge is too big, the door is probably too close to the strike jam, too. Sometimes carpenters run into this problem, and they think the door wasn't playing down or the jam wasn't built wide enough by the pre-hung manufacturer. That's what I thought when I first started hanging doors, but that's not often the case. To correct the hinge gap, you have to draw the jam back toward the trimmer. And once you do, it corrects a strike gap that's too tight. And here's how to fix that. It's so simple. Swing the door open. Take a long screw, one that'll go all the way through the jam. This is exactly what we did in the earlier program. We're going to take this longer screw and put it right through the hinge. And now you really want to feather that trigger. Because the amount of torque that you put on that screw is going to really impact the fit of this jam. It's gonna, it could really pull that hinge tight against that trimmer, and you don't want to do that. You just want to get it snug, just a little snug, and then see what happened. Check it out. Look at that. The head gap's perfect. The strike gap's perfect. And the hinge gap above the top hinge is starting to close up real nice. That's what I'm talking about. We can tweak that screw a little bit more or a little bit less. And down the road, if you ever have to make an adjustment on a door, like after the job's all done and you've got a little punch list or something, and the homeowner says, hey, my door's rubbing on the top, or it's rubbing on here or something, you can tighten or loosen up that screw. That's it. And that may be all you'll have to do to adjust that door. Now let's move on to the next step, and that's the bottom hinge right down here. And what we want to look at real close 
is the hinge gap beneath the bottom hinge. You can see right here, it's a little too tight. That's an area that a lot of carpenters really don't understand how to fix. We'll do that next. Okay, now we're gonna look at this bottom hinge. Remember, we fastened the jam at the very top and the very bottom, and we didn't shim behind any of the hinges. So there's lots of ways to adjust this jam. If the hinge gap below the bottom hinge is too tight, it frequently happens because the weight of the door compresses the bottom hinge. It can also put a belly in the jam. Then shim the jam just above the bottom hinge, not behind it, just above it, and not below it, just above it. And this is really important. This is something that another thing that a lot of carpenters miss. They don't have an opportunity to learn this trick because they only hang a few prehungs a year, 10 or 20. It's not until you hang a thousand that you really figure this out. And that's where I've been. I've hung thousands of prehungs in apartments and condos and tract homes, as well as hundreds and hundreds of hangs. And that's when you pick up these little tricks. Watch this. If I put my pry bar in just above that bottom hinge, you see the gap down here is too tight? Boom, it opens up that gap. But what's it do above the hinge? It closes that gap. Usually when this gap is too tight, this gap is too big. Remember, the jam is nailed at the very bottom, so it can't move down there. This is the really important reason why I tack the very bottoms of the jams and the very tops of the jams. As I put a little pressure on my pry bar, it'll close up this gap right in here and it'll open up this gap down in here. So all I really need to do is take a shim, slide it in here, take some pressure off of here just above the hinge, and slip that shim in there, and now we've got perfect gaps above and below the bottom hinge. Now, that'll raise the top of the door on the strike side just a little, but that can be a really good thing, especially if the head gap's too big. All right, so we've adjusted the bottom hinge now, and let's check the head gap and see what kind of an impact we had up there. And look at this, we didn't change the head gap at all. We were able to adjust the gap below that bottom hinge without affecting this gap up here at all, which is just what I was talking about. So now we know that the gaps are good in all the critical places, so let's pick up the other spots. One is the gap going down the strike side is way too big, so I'm gonna take my pry bar and I'm gonna take a little shim here. And remember, I put some tacks through that jam a long time ago just to set it so it would be fairly close. And those tacks are gonna really help me here. I can take this jam now and pop it up against the door. You can hear it, it's sliding across that nail. My shim won't fall out, because the nail's holding onto it. And I can just slide my shim in until it backs up right behind the jam. And now down here, I'm gonna do the same thing. Look at this, this gap's way too big. If I didn't have a nail below the shim, when I pull this jam over, this shim would have fallen right out of there. So that's another reason to put those nails in there. And now this one, this is kind of loosey-goosey. Let me put a nail in there. Just one tack. And now I can move this jam right up against the door. And that one nail will pretty much hold it. At least it won't let it go too far. And I'll put another shim in right above that nail, right here. There we go. Now that's better. Now we're getting pretty good. Now this one down here, we don't need anything. But let's put a shim down there. This is a really important one to install, actually. You want to fasten the bottom of the jam really good because, you know, the casing's installed. And when the finish guys come in and run the baseboard, if they cut the base a little too long, it can push this jam right up against the door. So you want to get a shim behind here, and then you're going to want to nail this jam off through that shim real good. And we'll do that in just a second. But let's first put a shim behind the rest of the hinges. On this opening, we've only got one hinge here in the center. On some of them, you'll end up with a door that's got two or sometimes three center hinges, you know, on a big tall one. When you do this, make sure again that you put your shims in above the hinge, just to back this jam up in case I need to ever get a screw into that hinge and pull the jam closer to the trimmer. Now I'm ready to nail off all of the shims and the jam. So to do that, I'll open up the door and grab my gun, and in case you didn't notice and I didn't say anything earlier, the gun I'm using here isn't a 23 gauge, it looks like it. This is the KDEX 18 gauge gun, and I'm shooting two inch uh, brass with this. Um, a two inch nail is more than sufficient to hold a helical prehung like this, especially once you start putting the longer screws through the hinges like I've done here. And then you put the casing on, and the whole thing will hold itself real good. 
On a bigger jam or a more um, heavier door, I'll probably use a 15 gauge gun with a slightly longer nail, like a two and a half inch nail. But right here, this is just fine. I'm gonna nail through all of these shims. It's perfectly okay to nail through them now, and besides, you have to because you have to cut them off, and if you don't nail through them first, they'll wiggle all over the place. So we're shooting through the shims now, and I put a shim above the top hinge too. I'm gonna shoot it off as well. Remember, we didn't need much of one because the trimmer was real close to the back of the jam on the top hinge. But I'm gonna put nails in all the way around the hinges now, all the way down the jam. Top and bottom. And while I'm here, I'm going to put nails in the very bottom of the jam. Remember, this is for the baseboard. So if the trim guys put the baseboard on too tight, it won't move the jam. That's why I've got these shims down here, too. And I'll nail off these two. We'll nail off the bottom of the jam, again, for the baseboard. And then a couple of nails through that shim, and a couple through this one. Some good nailing right through the shim near the strike. I'm going to put a couple more nails in around the strike. That's a location on the jam you really want to reinforce. And then nail off the rest of them. I could nail these off up here too. Now we can cut off all those shims and we'll be ready to case this opening. I use a multi-master. If I'm hanging a lot of doors, I'll use a multi-master like this to cut off the shims. If it's just one or two doors, I'll take a little Japanese saw like this one. Tajima makes a really nice set of Japanese saws. And the cool thing about them is they break down so you can put them back in your tool bag real quick. But when I'm hanging a lot of doors, I'll use the Multi-Master, it's just so quick. You can take the blade, lay it down flat right against the jam or against the drywall on the back. In these two video programs, I've covered most of the techniques for scribing and hanging new doors and old jams, and the really important ones for setting pre-hung doors too. Be sure to watch the slideshows, which cover common door hanging problems, and I've also included a few slideshows on making jigs and templates. Hanging doors is a part of our trade that's really dependent on your own ingenuity as a carpenter and on your willingness to spend a few hours in your shop now and then coming up with a new template or experimenting with a new technique. I can tell you one thing for sure. That kind of investment is never a waste of time. When you put a little extra effort into the craft, the payoff isn't just in productivity. You're going to find you'll have a lot more fun, too. Back in the early 1980s, we installed thousands of pre-hung doors in apartments and condominium projects. The doors came one of two ways. Some of them arrived with the casing already installed on the hinge side of the jam. Some of the jams arrived in a kit, knocked down. Those are called pre-fit doors. The pre-fits came with the casing on both sides of the jam, but the jam was in three pieces. To install the jam, you first slip the head up over the drywall, pushing it snug against the header. Then you tilt each leg so the tongue and groove joint interlocks, then straighten the leg. The joint locks in tight once the jam leg is plumb. Timely pre-fit metal jams are pretty similar. First you install the head jam. Next you install the strike jam and the hinge jam. Sometimes we set the jam and fasten it to the wall before hanging the finished door. 
but most often we swing the finish door and adjust the jam to that before fastening the jam permanently to the wall. But really, whether the jam is knocked down or the jam comes with the door installed and the casing on the hinge side, like split jams, the installation procedure is pretty much the same. If you install the casing first, nail it to the jam with 18 gauge brads. 15 gauge nails are too big and 23 gauge pins are too small for large casing, but sometimes they work great on medium and small casings. Follow the same procedure I demonstrated on the video. Prep the rough opening so that it's plumb and about an eighth of an inch wider than the OD of the jam. That's a critical step and makes the whole job faster and easier. Plus it improves the end result. Place the jam in the opening with the door and the jam. If the door isn't fastened to the jam, I like to drive a screw through the back of the jam into the door before moving the prehung. I remove the screw after the jam is in the rough opening. That just makes it easier to handle the whole prehung. Check that the jam is plumb. You can do that with a level. You should also check that the casing reveal is straight and true with other nearby doors or windows. If there's a nearby wall or casing on a contiguous door or window, measure from jam to jam or jam to casing and make sure the wall reveal between the existing casing and the new casing is even from top to bottom. Make sure the head gap is close. It doesn't have to be perfect, just within an eighth inch or so. A little tight or a little big is okay too. Fasten the hinge jam at the top and the bottom. That would be fasteners one and two. Push back the top hinge with your hand or step on a pry bar or door jack positioned underneath the lock style. That will close up the head gap. As a matter of fact, it might even be a little too tight, but that's okay for now. Drive a fastener through the casing into the wall behind the top hinge. That's fastener number three. Adjust the bottom hinge. Frequently the weight of a door will compress the jam near the bottom hinge. Notice how the hinge gap is too tight below the bottom hinge in this photograph. Step on the pry bar or door jack again to take the weight off the jam, then drive fastener number four. Now the hinge gap below the bottom hinge should be perfect. Adjust the strike gap and fasten the strike side with three or four nails. Before driving more nails, check for cross leg. At this point, it's very easy to adjust the jam at the bottom of the opening. If the top of the door isn't touching the door stop, move the bottom of the door on the hinge side out from the opening. If the bottom of the door isn't touching the stop, then either move the bottom of the jam on the hinge side into the opening or move the bottom of the strike side out of the opening until the stop touches the door. I usually split the difference and do a little of each. Shim the jam above or below each of the hinges and fasten the jam through the shims. If the gap is too big for one shim, break off a shim, reverse it, and then slide another shim in on top. Install a long screw in the top hinge. Don't torque the screw too much, just enough to carry the weight of the door. That screw is critical for supporting solid core doors, and it's great for adjusting doors if they ever sag and begin to rub on the strike jam. All you have to do is tighten up that screw a little bit. Now all that's left is installing the casing on the stop side of the door, and that's easy. If you're installing a new door in an old jam and you can't move the jam, Sometimes you have to move the hinges in order to correct for cross leg. Moving the bottom hinge out of the hinge mortise will bring the top of the door closer to the stop. Moving the top hinge out of the hinge mortise will bring the bottom of the door closer to the stop. When you move the hinge out from a mortise, the door will no longer be flush with the jam, but I've found you can make adjustments up to about 3 16 of an inch before it really shows. After that, you have to move the other hinge toward the stop. I'll talk about that in a minute. A VIX bit makes drilling new pilot holes easy, even if you're moving a hinge only an eighth of an inch. Moving the hinge in toward the stop can cause the door to become stop bound, where it catches on the stop and won't close properly. Removable stop can be repositioned without too much trouble, but when I have to move a hinge toward the stop on a rabbited jam, I plane the rabbit with a rabbiting plane. 